Our guest today overcame personal trauma to become an investment banker, inspirational speaker, and member of the HBS class of 2021. Let's hear her story. Welcome to the 311th episode of Admission Straight Talk, except it's a podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. I'm Linda Abraham, the founder of Accepted and the host of this podcast. My mission and passion is to help you show that you both fit in at your target schools and are a standout in the applicant pool. The result, you get a message one day that causes you to jump up and down shouting, yes, I'm in, and not only in, but in at the best program for you. Today's featured resource is Accepted's upcoming live webinar, Get Accepted to Harvard Business School. During the webinar, I'll present a four-part framework for MBA acceptance and apply it to Harvard Business School. Attend the webinar to learn what you need to do to present a compelling application to Harvard Business School. The webinar is free, but you do need to reserve your seat. To register, go to accepted.com slash 311HBS. Our guest today is Ida Valentine. She earned her BA from UNC Chapel Hill in 2014 majored in business administration at UNC and minored in Spanish for the professions. She joined Barclays Investment Bank upon graduation and today is an investment banking associate in Barclays Technology Group. Her side career is speaking to children and adults about her experiences overcoming sexual abuse and the traumatic loss of her parents at an early age. Final piece of important information, Ida is about to join Harvard Business School's MBA class of 2021. Ida, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me today. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Where did you grow up? What do you like to do for fun? Yeah, so I'm originally from Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, I grew up dancing my whole life. So started dancing at the age of three and continued all the way through college competing nationally. Uh, as you mentioned, I went to school at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, so I am a Tar Heel and uh, majored in business and actually minored in Spanish as well. Um, my brother did investment banking before me and kind of put the bug in my ear about what it was. Um, and so I've been doing that, you know, since graduating, since 2015, out here on the West Coast in Menlo Park. Absolutely love California, fell in love with California. Uh, like a true Californian, I love yoga, <laughs> um, especially <laughs> on a nice day. Doing it outside in the park it is definitely uh, something that I love to do for fun. Um, and then I also just love to get back in the community. Um, I'm on the leadership council for SEO, which is a nonprofit. It helps underprivileged children get to and graduate college. I'm an alumna of the program myself, actually. And what is, uh, what are the, what's the acronym stand for? Seizing every opportunity. Nice. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, great organization um, that I work with. And uh, I also volunteer with Rape Trauma Services out here in the Bay Area. I talk to high school students about my own troubles with sexual abuse and, and grief and how they can overcome the trauma and also my own public speaking platform as well that I know we'll talk about a bit later. That's right. Okay. Now for the last four years or since you got bitten by that investment banking bug, mm -hmm. you've worked in investment banking, uh, I think almost all in Silicon Valley and you focused on technology. What have you enjoyed most about your work? Yeah, I think the most important, exciting thing about investment banking and probably the reason why most people want to do it is that every day is, is something new. So when I was looking for what I wanted to do with my career, I, I wanted to do something that wouldn't have me bored within the first year. And, and you will never be bored with investment banking. So for me, I like that I get to work on M&A deals. I get to work on IPO deals. I get to work with internet companies, software companies, semiconductor companies. Um, and you do all these things at, at such a young age that you, you get this kind of rush of, wow, at 21, at 22, I am doing something that I think is meaningful. You know, I still remember my first deal that I did, like 21 years old, and you have all the late nights and, and you're working hard, you sleep deprived. Uh, you don't want to get yelled at, and um, the deal finally gets announced. And when you get to read the articles about that deal, that is a, a, a big feeling. And I don't know another industry at such a young age, you get this, this feeling of, wow, I did something meaningful. So to me, I, I just love the, the workflow, the deal flow, and, and, and learning about different types of companies and different products. 
That's great. Now, you mentioned the long hours, and obviously investment banking is famous for, for long hours. How have you handled yeah. those hours? You mentioned that you love to dance while also maintaining your speaking career, which we are going to get to. Yeah, um, it, was, it was not easy, um, especially at the beginning. So I started doing more formal speaking engagements probably a year and a half or, or two years into banking. So I'm still an analyst and still in the trenches, you know, working late hours. Um, but I think the, the thing for me that kind of made it possible was that I was able to communicate to my team, you know, well in advance of a speaking engagement. You know, I have this going on on this date. I will be away from my computer for, you know, at least two hours, but <laughs> happy to make that up on the back end. Um, and and, it, and it's not always the easiest conversation, depending on what deals you're working with. But uh, I, I think my group was very supportive. And especially at the beginning, it wasn't something that I was doing, you know, every week. You know, I was still an analyst and that was my priority. But now that I'm an associate, you know, I've had more flexibility. I have an analyst that is able to cover for me when I'm gone. And so it's definitely easier now because I'm, I'm a little bit more senior. Um, and, and I think if it's something that is important to you and, and you're able to portray this to your team in a way that doesn't, you know, make anyone angry, you know, you're still doing your job. I, I think if it's important to you, you know, you can, you can find the right balance to, to do something that you love, which can be your job and do something you love that can be volunteer work as well. So uh, it, it was definitely a, a, a balancing act, a juggling act, but um, I, I was able to kind of, kind of make it work as an analyst and now an associate. Great. And what about like time for yoga you mentioned earlier or dance? Yeah. You said you were dancing since three-year-old. I mean, just yesterday I got a video of my three-year-old granddaughter dancing up a storm uh, <laughs> of her own. Yeah. Um, I, I think so. So in banking, especially now, there's a lot of uh, junior banker initiatives. I think now is definitely the time to be a banker as opposed to, you know, 10 years ago when, when things were a lot different. So on Saturdays, we, we have something called Protective Saturdays, where you have to get permission before you can, can work on a Saturday. And so my Saturdays are generally like my yoga days in the park and uh, hanging out with family and friends. Um, and, and then you do have lulls in investment banking. So not every week is going to be you know, the, the 100 hour week. So I would take advantage of those weeks where it may be a little bit lighter and maybe I'll go out and you know, go do a book club or, or go do a meetup, which is um, a, an app that hosts different groups for, for adults. Um, and so I, I think you, you can find the balancing act. It's not easy, especially within your first year. I would say it was pretty uh, <laughs> pretty difficult to do. Um, but once you, you start to get the hang of what you're doing, you know, your hours will tend to, to get a little bit better. Um, and so I took advantage of my, my Saturdays for sure in, in those easier weeks. It can be done. It's not the easiest thing, but it definitely can be done in investment banking. All right. Now, you have an undergrad degree in business from UNC. You've been an investment banking analyst and associate mm -hmm. <clears throat> since 2015. You've worked on major M&A deals, done all kinds of intensive analysis, uh, mm -hmm. been on a deal team. With your extensive business background, why do you believe you need an MBA? Yeah, so I, I think if I was going to stay in this traditional route of, you know, investment banking long term or even, you know, private equity, the traditional finance route, I don't think I would have needed the MBA. Um, and I, I'm an associate now, which is a position that MBAs enter into in banking. So in, in terms of my field, I'm already, you know, where I would need to be. But uh, for what I want to do, I felt like I needed the MBA. So my my goal after business school and even during business school is to be an entrepreneur. So to actually start something from the ground up. Um, and I've gained a lot from investment banking, a lot of finance background, a lot of technical sure. um, you know, experience, but you need a lot more than that to be a, a successful entrepreneur. And so I felt like an MBA can bridge that gap. So one, the network was extremely big for me because if I am trying to start something, then I need co-founders, I need a CTO, I need a, a legal team. And, and what better place to bring all these wonderful, brilliant people together than MBA class and, and just the university itself that has all these different amazing schools where you can build your team. Um, so that was important for me. And also, how do you get capital, <laughs> which is important when you want to have a successful business? 
well, a business school is going to teach me how to pitch my, my company to VCs. It's going to host these competitions where VCs are coming to get talent from these great schools. And so this is another thing that was super important for me. And then I've never run a, a company. I've never been a CEO. And in the business school, I get to be a CEO every day in the case study method. method. And so I get to practice in a safe environment what I would do if I'm in the protagonist's shoes, if I'm facing these problems and don't know what the right answer is, how am I going to approach that? And so I don't think I would have gotten these skills if I were to just stop investment banking and, and try to do my own thing, especially because a lot of businesses aren't successful the first time around. And so I wanted to give myself the best platform to have a successful entrepreneurship experience. And so to me, an MBA absolutely made sense. Again, if I wanted to stay in the route that I, I'm in now, it wouldn't be needed. But um, because I'm trying to do something so different than what I've done, um, I think an MBA will, will give me the right platform to do that. And what about, um, well, you mentioned the, the people skill. Do, do you know what you want to go in or what area you want to go into with your business? Are you comfortable talking about that? Uh, I, I'm not sure exactly. I have a I have a few different ideas, but nothing nothing that I, I'm entirely sure about at the moment. Okay. All right. Let's turn to the application process itself. What was the hardest mm -hmm. part for you of the MBA application process? Yeah, I think uh, the hardest part for me was trying to figure out how to fit my personal story into an essay that would make sense for an admissions officer. And like, what I mean by that is, and especially people that will be writing their own personal stories and emotional stories, you can find yourself down this rabbit hole of, you know, I have to get every detail into this story. And then when you read it, it's like, okay, well, why does the admissions officer care? Like that, that's great that you've gone through these things, these, these dark things, and you've come out, you know, so successful, but why should we accept you? And, and that's the struggle that I, I found myself in of, of having like a three page autobiography and, and, and nothing that can be taken from that. Um, and so I think in, in terms of difficulty, especially when you're applying to multiple schools, because you cannot just copy and paste and those two essays are the same. 100%. Uh, I think, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and, and that can be a challenge in and of itself. Uh, that that was difficult for me, and and especially when my story is so emotional. I'm talking about sexual abuse that I've gone through. I'm talking about losing both of my parents in college, and and it can be hard to to put that in a business aspect. Um, but I think you know the resources that I used to help me, Natalie from Accepted, was an awesome coach that I had. Um, I agree. Who was able to give? Yeah, she she's awesome. Um, and she was able to give an outside perspective, you know, someone who hasn't known me, doesn't know me and can say, okay, I, I don't know if this part of your story is necessary for an admissions person. You know, I, I think that maybe you need to, to expand here. That was extremely helpful for me and, and actually saying I've gone through these things and because of what I've learned and how I've grown from these experiences, Harvard, you should accept me. That, that was that was probably the, the most difficult part. But once I was able to overcome that, that hump, it became a lot easier. That makes sense. And Natalie also, also brought the, she, she's evaluated, you know, thousands of applications. So she was mm -hmm. able to bring that perspective to your, um, your application process. Um, exactly. Now you mentioned that you almost approached the essay. Now that the Harvard's essay question, let's let's focus on Harvard for the moment. As we review your application, what more would you like us to know as we consider your candidacy for the Harvard Business School MBA program? Now Harvard has several short answer questions in, in its application boxes, if you will, but the essay question mm -hmm. is, is this one. I actually think it's an excellent question. <laughs> Not that they need my uh, approval, and, <laughs> and but I think it's an excellent question because I think it's a question that applicants should keep in mind when they're approaching whatever essay question they're responding to. It's what, given yeah. what they already know in the required portions of the application, what else do you want them to know that also answers their question? In Harvard's case, it was wide open. 
many of the yep. other schools have much more directed questions. But that that idea of what do you want us to know in addition to what we already know, I think is a really, really good question. So how did you approach that? I mean, you mentioned that you had this highly personal story to tell and mm -hmm. you, and you were kind of trying to figure out what is important for them to to know about to understand your story to understand your motivations to understand what you've done and how you've grown and how you how resilient you've been how did you approach mm -hmm. that um so my my first approach uh i actually don't know if it was the best approach but I, i'll say it anyway to yeah. hopefully save someone else from doing this approach okay um but but my my first approach was just I know I want to tell my, my personal story, so I'm just going to sit down and write about my personal story. And I say that this wasn't the best approach because, again, I didn't have that, that bridge into why admissions should accept me. And so, and, and it took a lot out of me emotionally, I think. I, I, was, I was going to ask people, you, was it cathartic? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I got the comments from some people, like coworkers that read my story that, you know, it sounded really angry and other things that said it just sounded all over the place. Um, and so because I took that approach, it was almost just like a, a therapy session of me writing down everything that had happened and then there was no real real goal to it. Um, but I think the approach that worked better for me, and, and this is why I think everyone should give themselves plenty of time to write like at least 30 drafts of, of each <laughs> essay. Um, <laughs> but the, the second approach that I think worked best was to actually have a, a, a brainstorm of what do I want the admissions reader to get out of this? And so the first approach is one, I, I want them to know my story because I feel like you don't know me if you don't know the things that I went through for many, many years of my life. And so I do want you to know this story. But then secondly, I want you to, to know what I gained from those hardships that I went through. And that was resiliency. That was my ability to talk about my story, to share my story with other people. With, with children and, and adults um, to help them, you know, further their own lives and find their own happiness and success. And then thirdly, I want you to know what my future goal is and how I feel like the things I've learned in my past are going to help me and how I feel like this business school program is going to help me. And I think once I was able to sit down and actually have a framework before just writing everything that I, I felt like people should know, it actually made my my essay have a lot more structure and, and it stopped it from being a you know four or five page essay about things that aren't necessary um so i, I think that approach of actually having a, an outline first before you actually write anything down is, is probably the best approach for dealing with harbor especially because it's so open-ended no word count like no word limit it is very right. open-ended and you don't want to go down the rabbit hole so that that was my approach second approach yeah. yeah and that's the one you you worked on and and you feel worked much more effectively yes and I, i'm very proud of that essay now if i could compare that essay to draft number one or even like draft number seven um the essay that i have now is a lot lot better it actually it has a, a flow yeah yeah yeah, yeah. uh my parents are, are my, my father is deceased, but they're both Holocaust survivors. And oh, wow. you know, they went, they, my mother lost her parents at a very young age. She was, uh, well, one when she was 12 and one or 11 and one when she was 13. And, wow. um, you know, my father was, was somewhat older, um, but he, he was in the, he ended up in the, in the gulag in the Soviet Union in a POW camp. And the conditions were absolutely wow. horrible. Um, and he never talked about his experiences. Mm -hmm. Only only like in the last few years of his life would he open up a little bit. He just didn't want to. My mother, yeah. at the age of 88, started speaking to, to, to student groups. And she oh, actually, wow. yeah, she's uh, almost 90 now and she's still occasionally speaking. Not a lot, but That's she awesome. talk about her, her experiences now. Um, but, you know, uh, more power to you that you were able to, to speak about it both publicly, and again, we are going to get to that, uh, as well as to write about it in a, in a meaningful way and to talk about how you, you've grown and how, how, you know, the resilience you've de developed 
I think we'd all rather not mm -hmm. go through difficult experiences that develop character and resilience. But unfortunately, that's mm -hmm. frequently where we get it from. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's, it's life sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Now, how did you prepare for your Harvard Business School interview, which is known for being a very probing interview? Yes. Um, so I, I first prepare by like printing out my application, every not just the essay, every part of the application, mm -hmm. um, and reading it inside and out. I just I wanted to make sure that if they ask me any question about any short answer or any work experience, that I can talk about it in an intelligent way. So that Good. was like my my first step, and and I think that maybe sometimes people don't don't focus on those small questions. Um, in your application when you're preparing. Um, so that was the first thing that I did. And then I also did mock interviews and I did them with like <laughs> any and everyone. So one with Natalie, again, who was my accepted coach. Um, but I also did them with coworkers who had gone through business school. They were asking me questions and I did it with myself as well. So I had a list of questions and I was literally recording how I was answering them, listening to them back to see Am I rambling? Do I like what I'm saying? Should I tweak it? Or, you know, what, what should I do to make this answer better? Um, and I, I tried to relax to prepare for the interview, which is not an easy thing to do. I don't think I managed to do that. Um, <laughs> Cause it is like the biggest, the biggest interview, at least it was of my life. Um, and so you're, you're trying to go in without all those nerves, but I just had to trust the preparation that I did and, and having Natalie there as well to help coach me through some of the things that I might get asked. It definitely helped. And I'm glad that I focused on the, the small parts of my application because they did ask questions that they couldn't have asked any other applicant because it was so specific to my application. And so that was definitely, you know, something that I'm, I'm glad that I, I prepared for beforehand for sure. Yeah, Harvard is it, famous it is, for that. It is scary because they have two people to to just oneself, so oh, really? that that also adds a little bit of a, a intimidation factor. But um, you just have to trust the the preparation. What was the most difficult or memorable question you were asked in your Harvard Business School interview? Yeah, so I I have kind of two questions to that. Okay. One was go for um, it. One one was not a hard question at all, but it, it caught me off guard, which was, you know, we they pulled me into the interview room and um, the, the pleasantries are done, you know, how are you, things like that. And then the first question she asked me was, tell me about what you did today before this interview. <laughs> and it, it, was, it was such a softball question that I just was not prepared for it because I'm ready for these like tough, hard questions. And now you're asking what I did today. And it, it just kind of took me aback. <laughs> Fresh so, with you. I, I say, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, so that question kind of, kind of took me on guard. So, I guess my advice there is to just be prepared for softball questions too. They, they are human, so they're not gonna, gonna come out. You know, the first question swinging, hopefully. Um, but, but I think the after that, when I actually got into the, the depth of the interview, um, one thing that I wrote about in my essay, which was literally like one sentence, was about how an undergrad. Uh, we did a, a case study um, and how that was a favorite class for me because I was able to, you know, embody the, the businesswoman, a CEO for this case study. And I actually did, did not realize that that one sentence would get so much um, time in my interview. Um, and so that was something that I actually hadn't prepared for so much. Um, and so I, I think the, the, key there is to remember that every little thing that you put in your application is fair game. That was literally one sentence out of like a, a two-page essay. And so if you're going to put something in there, be prepared to have a story. And, and thankfully, you know, it wasn't a lie. I did have this case study in undergrad, so I was able to talk about it. Um, but it was something that made me think like, oh, okay, they really know my application inside and out. Like, these questions are going to get tough. Be prepared. <laughs> and and I, I think that's that was different than other interviews, honestly. Oh, yeah. My other interviews were pretty much cookie cutter questions, I felt like, um, you know, questions that you could have asked 10 different people. Um, and so that, that was definitely a transition to, to get these more pointed questions from, from Harvard. Right. Harvard is famous for probing interviews and having mm -hmm. really, really reviewed your application, whereas mm -hmm. many 
people have blind interviews where the interviewer has uh, looks at your at your resume and that's it. That's all they know. Yeah. And then obviously and alumni really interviews. different and alumni also from not, other schools. Right, not admission staff. That both mm -hmm. both elements make for a very different qualitatively different kind of interview. Yeah. Absolutely. Now you were accepted at Harvard, and I think you were also yeah. accepted at some other places. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it might seem like a silly question almost, but why did you choose Harvard? Was it its brand? Was it the case method? Was it the location, the network, all the above, some of the above? What? Yeah. Um, so I can say it definitely was not location. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm from the South, so we don't get really cold winters. I've never had a real winter coat, winter boots. So it was not the location. I will say that. Okay. <laughs> but but I, I think You're not that dreaming the, of a white the, person. No. <laughs> um, but, but with that being said, it, it definitely was the, the brand for me and um, their entrepreneurship program. So again, I, I do want to be a, an entrepreneur and I, I do want to go to a school where when I'm trying to make these connections with whoever it may be, you know, people know the, the school that I went to. They know the Harvard name and, and, and it adds a bit of credibility to you. People are automatically going to assume that you're the smart person, whether you open your mouth or not. And so I, I really felt like that was important for someone who is trying to make a name for herself in her own business world. Um, and, and then the entrepreneurship program. I mean, I went to visit Harvard before I ever submitted my application. I went to the women's open house event. Um, and while we were there, there were three women panelists who were talking about the Rock Center and, and their own ventures with entrepreneurship. I think one woman was just starting a, a hair care line, actually. Another woman was doing something in sports accessories. And they were talking about how the Rock Center help them do a business that they thought was just going to be an idea. You know, they weren't sure if it was ever going to be successful. And so to hear this, and especially from women, you know, people that, that look like me up there talking about how Harvard is helping them be successful entrepreneurs, that meant, you know, a lot to me because especially as a woman, it, it can be harder to, to find the help and success that you need. Um, and so that kind of solidified that if I want to be a successful entrepreneur, I know that Harvard is going to be the place to foster that. And so it was the brand, it was the entrepreneurship program. And then again, the case study method, being able to sit in on a class and participate in the class um, as well for admitted students welcome, it's powerful. You know, you, you, you feel invested in these stories because you, you read them, you studied them, and, and you want to make you know, the right decision, whatever that is. And so, you know, the, these things kind of made Harvard seem like the, the perfect package for someone like me who wants to, you know, change from just a traditional finance route to a, a CEO. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, was, it was definitely um, an easy decision, decision aside from the location um, to, to go out to, to Harvard. I'm still a little nervous about the winter, but I'm still alive. <laughs> My my husband is from originally from from New York, but he went to school in Iowa of all places, which is actually colder than New York. Okay. And oh. he yes, and he talks about how there was at one point there was a, a student there, a foreign student I think from Thailand or Burma, some very warm place. Mm -hmm. And he said that, you know, the temperature got down to 65 and the, and the guy was wearing a parka and complaining about how cold oh it was. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You know, and you know, <laughs> even I know that's not cold. And I'm from Los Angeles. Yeah. But he was from a very, very warm climate. And as far as he was concerned, it was cold. So, you know, he said somehow the guy got through the winter. So I'm sure you will, too. Yeah. I hope I, I hope I will. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, let's let's move on and talk about your your other career. Uh, quite different from spreadsheets and financial models. Your career as an inspirational speaker. How did you get into that? Yeah, so I, I kind of got into it first um, very informally. I didn't have a goal of wanting to be a speaker, um, but it was right after you know, my parents passed. And to to give a little bit of context, and I've touched on it a bit, but a, a bit of context. I was sexually abused growing up by my father for, for many years of my childhood. Um, worked up the courage when I was a sophomore in um, college to actually report my father to the police. Cool. And as a result of these actions, my father killed my mother and then killed himself. 
Oh, no. So, and yeah, and this, this happened at 18 years old. So it's like your first step into adulthood and, and you're trying to navigate it without your parents. So for me, my first kind of speaking engagement, which I, I use that term loosely here, was um, going back to my dance studio where I danced literally from the age of three to graduating high school. I went back to my dance studio and wanted to have a talk with, with the girls that were there. You know, I asked the owner, can I, can I just have a session with them? And I just wanted to talk to them about unhealthy relationships because I, I really wanted to, to save them from going through the same things that my mom had gone through or to stop anyone from ever feeling the feeling that I was feeling in that moment. Um, and so that was kind of like my, my first step into it of, I think I can use this tragedy to help someone avoid this tragedy. Um, so that was kind of the first like step into it. And it felt good. It was healing for myself. And, and I hope that it was healing for other people that were listening to my story. Um, but, but then I decided, you know, I really want to do this, you know, more, more focused way. I, I want to make it a point to help other people. And so when I moved out to California, I joined Rape Trauma Services and I, I'm one of their speakers. So with them, I go to different high schools in the Bay Area and I tell them about my story. I, I, I tell them about my parents and, and how, you know, the, the conflict of loving and hating someone at the same time. You know, I love my dad. I also have hatred for my dad. How do you deal with that? Um, and I, I talk to, you know, a few hundred kids at this point, maybe 500 kids now at this point. Um, and I, I want them to know that if they are going through something the same way I was going through something, that they can find success. They can find happiness. You know, look at me. I, I'm, I'm an investment banker. I'm now going to Harvard Business School. You know, if I can do these things, you can too. And it, it will take work, but you can get there. And so I, I got into it really just wanting to help other people. I, I feel like if we talk about these things more, which, which we generally don't, um, if we talk about these things more, we can help save someone else from going through this same heartache and trauma. Um, and, and I really wanted to reach a bigger audience now. So, you know, I was focusing just on high schoolers with rape trauma services, and I decided to have my own speaking platform. Um, so I created a website, idavalentine.com, super simple to remember. Um, and, and with that, I've been able to reach even more people. So now I've, I've been on panels about sexual abuse and trauma, I also talk about success in college and success in the workplace. I've gone to different colleges and, and talked about how I became an investment banker, how I'm going to Harvard Business School now. Um, so, so my goal is just to, to touch as many people as I can and, and help them see that, you know, there is a life out there waiting for them and, and that it doesn't have to be a, a defining factor of you are a victim or you are a survivor. You can be so much more than just, you know, a, a victim or survivor. So that that's kind of my my reasoning for trying to do more speaking engagements and, and helping people out with their own lives the same way people help me with mine. That's, that's quite an inspiring story. Now, some people are, are, are crushed. I mean, it, it's an amazing story. Some people are, are crushed and, and broken by trauma. Some are made mm -hmm. stronger. To what do you attribute your ability to pick up the pieces of your life after the, the horrible events that you that you just described and the loss of your of your parents even though you had this very complicated relationship with your with your father mm -hmm. How, I mean to what do you attribute that strength yeah so I, I can I can give it multiple things I think one um, I did have a, a support system around me so I have three older brothers um, and when I first came out about the abuse, which I didn't do till I got to college, when I first came out about the abuse, um, my brothers are very supportive of me. Um, so that helped a, a ton. And I'd also be lying if I, I said I did it all on my own. Now, I also had to go to therapy. Yeah. I went to therapy to deal with the, the sexual abuse and then the loss of, of losing both of my parents. Because right. it was a, a feeling of, you know, this is my fault. Had I not said anything, my parents would be here. Um, so, so therapy helped a lot. But I, I think it, in, in kind of the, the inner resilience that I had was also kind of tapped in there. So I, I knew that I didn't want my dad to win. And, and this was something that I was eventually able to, you know, get out of the mindset of living to, to, uh, living for my dad and starting to live for myself. But at the time it was, you know, I, I don't want him to think that he can do this and that I'm just going to fail. 
And so it became something in me to say that I have to show my dad and my mom that I am bigger than this. And so I was going to finish college. And I, and I talked to the deans of my school to make sure that I was able to finish on time with you know, the, the schooling that I missed from losing my parents. And I was going to keep dancing because this was something that gave me joy. And so it was really just about finding the things that continue to make me happy, even in these dark things, and embrace them. You know, I, I embrace dance. I, I embrace friendship. I, I embrace talking to people. And so it was that inner resilience that also helped a lot. But I, again, having my support system and, and having someone that I can talk to about these things definitely helped. And as I continued to tell my story, I healed a little bit each time. It was like I, I was starting to break free of the shackles of, of trauma and abuse because I, I wasn't hiding from it anymore. This is my story. This is who I am. I'm not ashamed of it. And I think once I was able to start embracing that, I was able to get a little bit stronger and a little bit stronger. So it was a lot to deal with. You know, it, it can still be a lot to deal with. I miss my parents all the time. Um, but, you know, telling my story helped me feel free from, you know, the weight of, of abuse and grief. And, and it's, it's been helpful for me in my life. We, um, we suffered the loss of our, our youngest child about 20 years ago. I'm so sorry. Uh, and, and at the time after he, he passed away, it was a, we went to a, a retreat for bereaved mm -hmm. families. And one of the points that was made there was that the best source of, of comfort really is trying to turn the tragedy into something, not so much turn the tragedy into something positive, but to do something positive as a result. Mm -hmm. So that's what you've done. Yeah. That's what yep. you've done. And it, and it feels good. Yeah. And it is a source of strength. You know, there, there can be mm -hmm. multiple kinds of, of trauma and, and I'm not in any way comparing or trying to say which is worse, which is that, that forget it. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not into that at all. But yeah. that was one lesson that I definitely took away from that retreat. And I, and I, as you were talking, I was thinking that's exactly what you've done. And, and you're doing it very effectively. Now, what are your plans for, I mean, you've said that you want to go into entrepreneurship after Harvard, but how do you intend, like, what are the, some of the things you want to get involved with while you're, while you're at Harvard? Have you thought about that at all? Yeah, so I definitely want to join the entrepreneurship clubs and things like that. But yeah. you know, I do want to do startup boots. Yeah, exactly. I do want to do, you know, startup boot camp. I do want to do venture competitions. Um, you know, the, the summer between my first and second year, um, I, I want to head down, be in the innovation lab with, you know, whoever other team members that I, I choose to do things with and focus on that full time during that summer and hopefully, you know, get the, the fellowship funding to, to focus on that. And, you know, my, my second year, again, continue to focus on obviously school. It's a very important thing. Um, but, you know, focus on whatever entrepreneurship idea I have. That way, when I graduate, you know, I'm, I'm hitting the ground running. And so I, I plan on, you know, using, utilizing all the resources that Harvard has. And, and again, the travel, I think, as well. I think a lot of good ideas come from being in diverse environments. Um, and when I'm traveling with, you know, my classmates and, and doing things for international businesses um, and some of the classwork that, classwork that you have, I think that that'll help me bring back good ideas as well to, you know, the innovation lab, which is where a lot of entrepreneurship happens at Harvard. Um, and so my, my plan is to go all in, bunker down on, on focusing on something that hopefully will be, you know, a good idea and continuing to focus on that, you know, the, the next few years after graduation. So that, that's the goal. We'll, we'll see what, what hits me while I'm there. Um, but, you know, I've already started meeting a lot of the other admins in the San Francisco Bay Area in the admin weekend. And there are a lot of people that, you know, kind of have this entrepreneurship bug. So I know I'll be able to, you know, form oh, yeah. a team pretty quickly and, and hopefully, you know, hit the ground running in my second year. I'm sure you will. What would you have liked me to ask you? I think I would have liked you to ask me um, just about the the process of, of business school once you get admitted. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think like what did ask? <laughs> yeah. So I, I think once once you get that acceptance letter, like it's, it's a big exciting day, and you, you can't even think about work anymore. Um, <laughs> but then, <laughs> but then uh, you you kind of have to start thinking about okay, now what what does this mean? And and so you you 
go to admitted students welcome you get you know two days of actually going to class talking to professors learning about what a, a venture competition is uh, meeting other other classmates figuring out where you want to live okay what is school actually going to be like now that you've been working for however many years you've been working so one of the things Harvard has you do is um, take, I think, like three online like placement tests. That was interesting results for me <laughs> for some of the some of the things that I took. And so I, I think now that I've gotten through the process of okay, I'm going to business school. The kind of transition part is how do you get back into that school mode? How do you start studying for econ again um, that you haven't thought about since like freshman year of college? And so I think the, the transition for me, and I, I'm still trying to, to balance this, is now how do you turn this switch on, this school switch on? Um, and, I, and I have no doubt that Harvard will give me all the resources that, to help me do that. But and in terms of the, the summertime period that I'm in now of, um, you know, at my job and also trying to study for these placement courses and doing Harvard's online classes, it's it's a tough transition that you don't think about while you're applying. You you just think you're gonna start school in, in August or September and be on your merry way. So I, I think I, I would I, I need some some press in terms of getting back into to school and learning what what that means to take placement tests again and and take these online classes. But I think I, I'm overall excited about the the um, you know opportunity to be able to say I'm going to be an, a Harvard grad. Um, but just the transition period can be a little bit uh, tough, I will say, <laughs> um, getting back into getting back into school mode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can I can appreciate that. I think it's a great point to make. So I thank you for raising it. And it's uh, like for any transition, it's exciting and a little scary mm -hmm. and all, all that rolled into one. Exactly, exactly. Ida, I really want to thank you so much for this absolutely amazing interview, for sharing your story, even if it is difficult. And I want to ask you, where can listeners find you if they're interested in, in engaging you as a speaker? You mentioned the URL, but if you could give it again. Yes, it's www.idavalentine.com. That's I-D-A, Valentine, like Valentine's Day, dot com. If you go to that website, you'll have contact information for myself, and, and you can learn a bit more about where I've been speaking and what topics I cover. Great. Thank you. Now, we're going to link to Ida's site from the show notes at exceba.com slash 311. Listener, I want to thank you, too, for joining Ida Valentine and me for Admission Straight Talk's 311th episode. If you find the show worthwhile, I have a favor to ask. Please tell your friends about the podcast. Your doing so helps us spread the news about admission, admission straight talk. Reminder, uh, you can register for Accepted's upcoming live webinar, Get Accepted to Harvard Business School, which I will present on June 5th. The webinar is free, but you do need to register, and you can do so by clicking on the link in the show notes at accepted.com slash 311. Thanks again for coming. This is Admission Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I am your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. Our theme music is provided by podcastthemes.com.